Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Hi everyone, this is Wendy. Before we get into today's discussion, I just wanted to thank Mike and Allison for taking the reins on this week's episode. I didn't participate in the discussion, but I sure did enjoy listening to it and hearing the very cool stories that Allison brought back from Hawaii. So thank you, Allison, for sharing that with us. And also, I have it on good authority that Allison is celebrating a birthday here. So if you'd like to send her a birthday greeting, please go ahead and do that on Twitter. Her Twitter handle is at Milwaukee Ghosts. I know she enjoys hearing from people and who doesn't enjoy a little birthday love. So happy birthday, Allison. And I hope you enjoy your entire birthday month. It doesn't need to stop after just one day. The show notes for today's episode, which are frequently referenced throughout, can be found at othersidepodcast.com slash 57. And now I'm going to hand the show right over to Mike and Allison. See you on the other side, episode 57. Aloha, Allison. Aloha, Mike. You got the flower, the Hawaiian flower in your hair actually today. That's right. It's called the plumeria. The plumeria. It puts you in the mood to talk a little bit about Hawaii. Absolutely. I'm always in the mood to talk about Hawaii since I I visited there this summer. So that was your first time in Hawaii? Yes. I've only been waiting like about 25 years. Okay. And so you re- <laughs> Okay, and so you really liked it. Oh my god. The 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 worst part was just getting back on the plane to come home. Sorry to say. Okay. Yeah. No, I I can imagine it. It's hard to it's hard to leave such a beautiful place. I haven't been there, but I I just seeing your pictures and stuff like that made me cry. Well, hopefully next time you'll be along. Yes, I hope so too. The the only reason that that I could go is because we have cousins that live there. And for about 25, 30 years, every time we get a birthday card or a Christmas card, it says, please come to Hawaii, stay with us. Yes, it and, does. And they upped the ante this year where they said, oh, we have two cars, you can use our cars. So, oh. yeah. I, I mean... When you consider that that uh, Hawaiian hotel rooms, we were actually in Oahu, uh, and hotel rooms in Oahu are uh, at least a hundred, uh, probably actually two hundred dollars a night. Uh, yeah, staying there okay. for eleven days like we did, we wouldn't have been able to afford it without the graciousness of our cousins Jeff and La Ling. No, they're great, and and well, didn't um, now let's talk about so you you. S- went for a whole bunch of haunted like locations and stuff like that when you were in oh, Hawaii yeah. and, and did well, some investigation of well, the I, island. Yeah, anywhere anywhere I go, if you know me, you know anytime I go on vacation, I got my eye out for a ghost. I am looking for the weirdness. Yeah. Yeah, any local weirdness, I'm into it. And I was really surprised that uh, our own cousins, um, Jeff and Laling, uh, well, Laling, who was originally from Guam, had her own story from downtown Honolulu, a prominent office building there. And so I didn't even have to go too far. Uh, as soon as I started talking about ghosts, uh, Laling was all about it and, and uh, wanted to share her story. Okay, fantastic. So let's, uh, let's hear a little bit of the story that uh, Laling has from the Puaui Tower in Hawaii. My name is Laling Buckley. This is the story of the Pohai ghost on Bishop and King Street in Honolulu, Hawaii. That way. So his building, Pohai Tower, is right there. And I used to work in the other building. Jeff had to do a, a, a lot of work one weekend, and it was kind of late, quiet. So I was getting tired, and I decided it was a big office, and it has a sofa. So I decided just to lie down, not disturb him, and just let him do his thing. And as I was lying there, I knew it was close to midnight. I heard a lot of children, not only two or three, but maybe ten, running around right outside the door. And I know that outside the door, there are six elevators, right and left, and it was very close to me. And the children running and giggling and everything else. And I said to myself, oh, I'd like to check that out. So as they were really running and giggling, I opened the door immediately to catch them. Boom, nothing. 
not even a single drop of anything. Okay, so I, uh, I didn't make anything out of that. So later, when we were in the office down in Kaimuki, they had deposition, and during the deposition, there was a break. And the people came out, and I was in the uh, front room. We were talking about something, and I brought up the story about the uh, Buhari Tower. And one of the attorneys uh, said, Ah, that place is haunted. And I said, Why is it haunted? And he said, Well, long time ago, many years ago, when, before that building was built, it used to be a children's playground. A lot of children play around. And then they built that tower. And ever since then, you know, um, they consider that place haunted. And I heard a story also of one secretary who used to work at the Puhari Tower that she left because of the ghost. I don't know whether she did actually see a ghost or not, but it was because of the ghost, ghost that uh, she had to uh, leave the office and not work there anymore. Too bad I didn't see those ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Turn it off, huh? Okay, and you visited the Pauly Tower, right? Well, we did. Uh, we didn't actually go inside because it was a Sunday, but mm-hmm. we, we saw the beautiful office tower and we, we took a picture of it that we'll you know, put in the show notes, of course. But uh, yeah, it was interesting to hear La Ling's story because it it was different than other stories I've heard in that it didn't sound like there had been any tragedies on the land there that, that we know of. Mm-hmm. But instead, it, it sounds like more of a residual haunting, that there was a uh, long ago a children's playground there. And no longer, it's a huge office tower, but somehow the spirits of, of those children uh, laughing and playing uh, in that uh, playground uh, still permeates the building at times. Okay, that, no, that is interesting. So, so for it, once... It's more like a recording. Yeah. It's more like a recording than a... Than some kind of like some like some child was knifed murderously. That's right. This time everyone lives. Yes, yeah, right. Everybody <laughs> lives one time only. <laughs> one time only. So um, it, it was a really kind of a cute ghost story. Okay, well that's 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 great. It's always nice to hear a voice. They really are wonderful family members. And uh, I know that that wasn't the only thing. <laughs> oh so, no, so, that was just the appetizer. Right. So every time that we go on a trip. Um, I know that I like to take the ghost tour, and I know that you do too. So I, I'm pretty much obsessed. I mean, I, I any any time you go anywhere with me, I'm like, let's find those ghosts. Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to just take one ghost tour. I want to take all of the ghost tours. How and, many? How and many I got pretty. Tour? I got pretty close. How many ghost tours are there in Oahu? Well, um, there are three major ones: uh, Mysteries of Hawaii, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, Oahu ghost tours. And uh, Honolulu Ghost and uh, Mystery Tours. So which ones did you go on? Well, uh, we went on uh, the Mysteries of Hawaii tour of Honolulu. And then we also went uh, on uh, one of the uh, Oahu Ghost Tour bus tours. Okay. So the first one was a walking tour. And uh, then we also went around the island um, on uh, what was on, your, a, on what, a, like a bus tour. What was your favorite? Well, I'm going to make you wait for my favorite uh, because there was so many, so many great stories and uh, so many experiences I had there. But, you know, my favorite is going to have to do with uh, Mysteries of Hawaii because uh, the host actually befriended us after the walking tour of, of Honolulu. And um, on a subsequent night, we went out with he and his wife and uh, my husband Scott. Okay. We we went all over Oahu to some sacred sites, just just us four, and we had a magical night. Okay. Well, let, let's talk about that in a second. But but right now we have a little bit of audio from what was what was your host? What was the uh, the, ho- the is, ghost host with the most? <laughs> yeah, in his Oahu. name his name is Lil Paka, and the reason why I was so excited about. Uh, going on a Mysteries of Hawaii tour is because uh, ghost tours in Hawaii were started in the 1980s by Glenn Grant. And Mike, you might remember Glenn Grant because he was on with Art Bell and he was on... I I don't remember him right now, but I'm sure if I heard him... Yeah, he was on Coast to Coast quite often uh, talking about these, what he would call chicken skin stories of Hawaii. What what, what is the chicken skin? Well, you know, we get 
goosebumps because oh, prickly. it's so right. freaky. I get, it. I get it. All, all these stories that he had collected over the years. And a few years back, uh, unfortunately, he died of cancer, and he passed on his tours to a native Hawaiian named Lopaka. And Lopaka's really made it his own. Uh, and interestingly, Glenn Grant all, always felt that the tours should be given by a native Hawaiian. Uh, so it was exciting to be able to meet the, the person who had inherited the tours from Glenn Grant. Sure. And because I, I just really, you know, love thinking about people that's, that were the progenitors of, of ghost tours were our ancestors in a way because I, I do so. the Milwaukee ghost tour, you do the Madison ghost tour. And and, and the Minneapolis one coming soon, minneapolisghosts.com. That's right. Launching, launching this fall. And so we, we have uh, our, well, not exactly a mentor because we didn't know him that well, but but... As children, we really looked up to uh, Richard Crow from Chicago, who sure, started he... ghost tours there in 1973. And I always considered Glenn Grant, who started tours in Oahu in the 80s, like to a be... much smarter Richard Crow, <laughs> because he gets to do tours in paradise. <laughs> That's right, as well, opposed to tours in the winter in, in Chicago. And weather, we had, we yes. had fun. When we went on Richard Crow's tour. I mean, that was really exciting. Was but, a bit cold. It's yes. nothing like Hawaii, but but I consider Glenn Grant to be the Richard Crow of the Pacific. So that's why I was so happy to go on that original ghost tour given by Lopaka. And this story he's about to tell you um, is one of the stories he told us, uh, Scott and I, when we went out, out on that private tour with him to some of the sacred sites around Hawaii. Okay, so this is a little bit from Lopaka of Mysteries of Hawaii? That's right. And we'll put the link in the show notes. So two years ago, a friend of mine tells me that a a lifeguard relates to her this incident where two guys were fishing here at the beach. And as they were pulling in their net, they said there was a Hawaiian woman caught in their fishing net. And she was yelling at them to let her out. And so they got her out of the net and they realized that she was naked, that she had long black hair. She was very pretty, but they noticed that she began to walk up closer to them, that her eyes actually rolled over black. And she had a black forked tongue, and they took off running. A couple of days later, the lifeguard says two more fishermen come up to him screaming that they dumped out their styrofoam coolers in the garbage bin at the first bathroom. And all the contents that they dumped into the garbage bin came flying back out. And that this Hawaiian woman climbed out of the garbage bin, long black hair, no clothes on. And when she looked at them, her eyes rolled over black, and she had a black forked tongue. And so they believe that it was the Mo'owahine, the lizard goddess, who was looking for a meal. And what's strange about that is her home is actually in the cave about a mile away from the beach that we're at now. And so the elders out here were trying to figure out why was she out of her element? And what was she doing here? And who was she looking for? This is Lopaka Kapanui, and this has been Mysteries of Hawaii. Tales of the unknown and the strange in the Pacific Islands. We're at Keawaula Beach on the island of Oahu, a very active place where the dead leap into the next world where we have night marchers and strange beings that appear to the unwary who are here too late at night. Okay, he even ends with a little flourish there, like Absolutely. a little sales pitch. Well, he's got, he's got so many stories. Uh, one that really resonated with me from the Honolulu walking tour that he did was he... We were on the grounds of um, Iolani Palace, and let me just apologize to all my elders and to uh, any uh, Hawaiians that may be listening. Bring your elders. Well, the, <laughs> I work at a, a Native American school, okay. and something you say before you speak is, I I apologize for speaking in front of my elders, but I'm apologizing to all the Hawaiian people and anyone that's really good at pronunciation because I know... A- I'm going to slaughter some names here. Is there a word for butchering your language? <laughs> I, like, I, 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 I apologize for butchering your language on this one. Yeah, well, I just, I've just noticed that when I went to Hawaii that I have some kind of unique impairment where I can't seem to deal with too many vowels. Well, I shouldn't say too many vowels. It's just too many for me strung together. I, I, my mind just like boggles and shuts down well, when I, I when think- I see you know a whole string of vowels together. I just don't know what to do and I start panicking. 
speaking. <laughs> well, I think I think it's the same. It's, it's funny because it's the same thing. There's the whole string of vowels when you get things like Hawaiian or native languages, and then yeah. there's a whole thing where you, there's a whole string of consonants when you get like Eastern European languages. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. You, you just want those guys to buy a vowel, yeah. and then you go to Hawaii and you find out, hey, they have all the vowels right, over here. You, you, Could you borrow some to Eastern Europe? Could just lend them some, right, please? Because those guys just look angry and need some vowels. <laughs> that's right. And I think I think maybe that's why Hawaii, part of the reason Hawaii is paradise, because they have all the vowels over there. All the oohs and ahs belong to Hawaii. It's <laughs> a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. A good way to put it. So um, what really called to me from this tour was the story of the calling ghost or calling spirit. And we're, we're on the grounds of the uh, Iolani Palace, uh, which is the only royal residence in the United States where King Kamehameha once lived. And, um, what do you mean it's the only royal? Okay, so I guess there's no other palace in that United States proper where like a king actually lived. That's right. Uh, only in Oahu. There was no kings of the Native American tribes, like the Indian tribe. There's no... I guess it just... I mean, I was just wondering if there was like a grand emperor or something like that. <laughs> no, of the Iroquois yeah, nation or yeah, whatever. Yeah. That's a fair question. Um, it is. It is. It's just funny that, to hear grand emperor. Come on, the, not that I'm aware. I'm not an expert. The Iroquois confederacy. I'm not an you know. expert. But again, I apologize if I'm getting that wrong. But uh, yeah, so this is the only royal residence in the United States. And uh, it was quite a beautiful grounds. Um, and there was this uh, one area which is associated with something called the calling ghost. And we'll put a picture up of it but it kind of looks like i mean it looks like a european style place doesn't very it? much so, so when you think of the royal palace the king kamehameha you're probably you i mean you might think of a hut or something like and it's not like that it is modern not modern like it's not like frank lloyd wright or cubist or something yeah. like that but it's certainly when you picture a palace it looks like it's, something out of it's Buckingham Palace. Very or something like European that. influenced. Yeah, and why is that European? Is it because of the the trade b- between the Native Hawaiians and Cap- well, Captain Cook got a trade? <laughs> <laughs> yes, whatever, well, whatever he brought, he got an arrow to the chest. That's right. Well, um, I, I can't speak to that. I'm I'm not a not an expert on uh, Hawaiian lore or or history, but it might be good to have Lopaka on the podcast on a, at a later date. Sure. Because he would he would be the expert that would be able I to answer your just questions. Just interested, because when, you, when yeah. you show me the picture of the palace, and you see this in the show notes, to me, I'm like, what, that, that Hawaiian guy lived there? Like, you, it's just, it did not come into my head. So I just think- Yeah, you expected to see something more traditional. Yeah, or just, you know, something, it might be, you know, awesome, but it might be like a, a huge, like- a thatched roof or something the professor would build on Gilligan's Island or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> this is our reference point, Gilligan's Island. Well, you know what I mean. Anyway, <laughs> no, it just I looks know, like but a- that's really true. When we think of when we're reaching to understand things uh, that are foreign to us, you know, no no offense is ever intended, but right, we, that's just we, what you think of. Yeah, we reach for for what we have, and a lot of times it's. Uh, from TV shows like Gilligan's Island. Right. <laughs> That's what comes to mind you're immediately. Like, you're like, wow. Okay, <laughs> so you're at you're at King Kamehameha's royal palace. That's right. And uh, there was one area, uh, I think it was, it was formerly a well, and there was a story surrounding it called a calling ghost story or calling spirit, uh, it is also known as. And I... Actually, all around Oahu and perhaps the other islands in the Hawaiian archipelago as well, there are these stories of calling ghosts. And the idea of this ghost is it will call your name and you'll hear someone call your name. And so you you turn and look and that's how they get you. You know, they get your attention and then they draw you in with incredible beauty. So... This beautiful woman appears. She's the one calling your name. All right, tell me and more. Draws you in closer and closer. And then as she does this, you don't realize that that you're about to step off a precipice or you're about to drown in the river. But that's what happens. Oh, so there's a calling ghost in the well at that's, near the, near the royal palace. That's right. And apparently 
she called people to their death in that well, and now that well is filled in with cement. Good, good. So she can't get <laughs> she can't get anybody that's, anymore. That's right. But uh, the thing that really resonated with me about it was uh, that episode that we did a few weeks ago on the hidden truth and all the lacrosse uh, river deaths. That's right. And how mysteriously they only seem to uh, target or they only seem to affect young men. And this, again, the calling spirit was a ghost that would drown young men by seducing them, essentially, and then drowning them when they least expected it. And that, and I think that's interesting, too, because, I mean, we're finding this these stories in Native cultures and in not just when we think of traditionally, you know, a Native American, a Native Hawaiian or Indian, you know, you're finding it in stories from uh, European, too. Uh, I mean, it's all over the world. Right, because we talked about in that episode, uh, the Waterman, which was a, a Slavic right. legend and the, to explain and, and the Kelpie, river deaths. The Kelpie, which is a uh, Scottish legend. Absolutely. So the, the thing is, people being drawn by something beautiful in the water, and it's always, I mean... I mean, they always say that it's, you know, these dumb guys like, hey, look at that hot chick in the water. I better go jump in there. <laughs> you know, they all, but the fact, I mean, these stories are every culture has them. That's right. Well, actually, this is just bringing to mind. I was watching um, old episodes of Kolchak the Night Stalker and, <laughs> on and, YouTube. As you do. As you do. You know, you get bored. And um, I remembered this hilarious episode about uh, a, an Indian spirit, East Indian spirit called the Rakshasa. And in that in that episode, again, we're going back to old TV. This is <laughs> right, but <laughs> this I mean, is the tapestry of our minds. But uh, the the Rakshasa would lure people to their deaths as well by appearing as someone they trusted, and so they could draw you in and. And eat the flesh off your bones. Okay, great. That's nice. <laughs> but yeah, do check that out. Uh, that that's a great uh, episode called "Horror in the Heights." So okay. I would we'll recommend put, it. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. And if you haven't seen Cold Check Tonight Stalker, get ready for some excellent '70s horror because <laughs> that's it's it and is, it's funny too, and not just unintentionally. I think I think they were, were really trying, especially especially in that episode, "The Horror in the Heights," uh, but. This leads me to talking about another Hawaiian legend which really startled me. We we went on the Oahu uh, ghost tour, orb bus tour. Okay. I know, anything with an orb in it <laughs> kind of makes it, me too. Why was it called the orb bus cringe. tour? Well, you know, the idea is that you take pictures and you get orbs in your pictures and... And yeah, I was... So it means you get dust? Yeah, or moisture, right? And so this is what I was thinking, and I wasn't expecting much from it, but I really did enjoy the story. stories. One in particular, uh, we got out of of this uh, of the bus, and we um, were in this beautiful lush valley, and there's hiking trails through there. And the guide started telling us about the legend of Kaupei. And Kaupei was a cannibal in ancient Oahu. And Was he, he just a cannibal? Or was it was it was there like a whole group of cannibals no, or anything? This the Kaupei guy just a singular cannibal who um, was eventually defeated after eating lots of people, unfortunately. And then after his, his death, he was cr cursed to roam the earth as a dogman. And the guy described modern sightings along that road as something that was eerily similar to something that, that we've talked about locally. And it really, really startled me. He talked about that there will be people driving along the road and they will see a creature uh, off to the side of the road, eating roadkill. Okay. And they think it's a dog until it stands up. And what does that sound like that to you, Mike? Like one of, that sounds like the Beast of Bray Road. It sounds like one of uh, Linda Godfrey's bipedal canines. Yes, absolutely. So I was shocked going, you know, all the way to the other side of the world in Oahu and to find a description of what witnesses are experiencing that 
was pretty much spot on with what they're experiencing on Bray Road in Alcorn, Wisconsin. But, you know, what I think is interesting about bipedal canines is that, is there a chance that just there is some, not necessarily breed of dog, but there's just some dogs that are, um, like, not that they were taught, but, you know, dogs can be taught things. I mean, I don't think they would, rem- I mean, it'd be part of their instinct, but they some had, there's some residual instinct to stand up every once in a while because it scares the crap out of people. Like, <laughs> no, I mean, think about it. If you're a dog and you want to scare a predator or, sc- I mean, are dogs native to Hawaii? Well, I, I mean, they must be, yeah, they, I, they must have gotten there fairly, they must either be native or have gotten there pretty early to have a cannibal guy become a dog man. Well, that's true. If it's an ancient Hawaiian legend, which my understanding is that it is, again, I'm not an expert, but um, from what I heard, it's it was an ancient legend. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe there were um, certain breeds of dogs that were native to Hawaii. I'm not sure about that. But in Hawaii, uh, or in Oahu anyway, uh, there were all kinds of animals like everywhere. Like and Oahu is the the island that Honolulu is on, right? That's right. And that's known as the Big Island. No, the Big Island is actually Kona. Okay, so um, Kona is the Big Island. Yeah, the Kona is the Big Island. And so, is there any? Uh, like, is there a city on Kona, or is that just military stuff? Well, no, oh, no. You know, there's cities uh, on most of the islands. Okay. But, but yeah, well, I'm, I'm for sure, Mike, going to get right on to investigating the other islands as soon as possible. <laughs> right. Don't as you as... worry about it. Okay, but you didn't see the dog man, right? No, I mean, if I would have seen the dog man, Mike, I would have called you immediately, even though it was... Even if it was 3 a.m. for you, I would have said, Mike, I've seen the dog, man. My life has changed. It's all real, Mike. It's all real. Be afraid. Be very afraid. The, the dog men are real. They're coming for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, okay. Okay. That's fair enough. But, okay. So what, what I have to say is that I did see a lot of dogs there, but only in a certain area. And there are a lot of animals everywhere on Oahu. Uh, and many of these Animals are not native, but it's paradise there. So you have wild chickens everywhere, you have wild cats everywhere, and you have wild dogs. Uh, but they were pretty cool and not in your face and not trying to eat you or anything like that. Right. But um, they're just hoping to get domesticated and get a regular meal. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, what was interesting is, um, as I mentioned, we we did go with uh, Lopaka and his wife to some sacred sites around Hawaii. Uh, one night and then subsequently like the next day I was like I want to go back Scott we got to go back and see these places in the daytime okay and and one of these places we're walking around and it's surprising how many memorials you see traditional Hawaiian memorials people that aren't buried in graveyards but along along the beaches for example and or yeah, just very close to the beach, um, off in the bush, just just a little distance. You're walking down a, a hiking trail. You, you make a turn, and then suddenly you see monuments that are that are simple rock monuments. That uh, many of them d- don't have any inscriptions whatsoever. They're just beautiful to me. That's the kind of mo- monument um, I want when I go. Is just uh, a natural uh, rock. Uh, monolith and so uh, one of the things we saw uh was we're walking along and we we make a turn and we see these monoliths and when i say monoliths they're not huge i mean but you know they are like two to three feet tall um rocks and we saw a white one and a black one and then right after we saw that and there were people buried under the yes the black one okay that's right or at least their ashes. But um, right after that, as if we <laughs> were seeing the spirits that were uh, connected with the graves, we saw a tiny little white puppy uh, run out in front of us and then run back into the bush. And then we saw an exact copy of that white dog in black oh. run in- past us and into the bush. So... You know, maybe it was just my vacation mind, but but to me, 
it seemed like a message of some kind that I didn't know how to decipher. It, it seemed very Lost esque. Mike and I were big Lost fans when the TV show was on. Well, yeah, it's because Lost is the best. Absolutely, and they they had those smooth smooth stones which featured prominently in in the show one black one and one white one. Oh, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah, that is right. Okay. So so that made me think of Lost. Oh my gosh, again into the tapestry of the mind, <laughs> which is populated entirely by old TV. Right, it's already it's all, it's <laughs> syndicated all populated. television is <laughs> taking over our minds. <laughs> it has because now we're just looking at things through the lens of Lost. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but you also went, I mean, to some of the Lost filming locations. Oh, we did. Yeah, we visited Kualoa Ranch, which is also on the island of Oahu. And that's where um, all the Jurassic Park movies have been filmed there and many TV shows and, mov- and movies, including, of course, the TV show Lost. So, And probably some Magnum P.I. too. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. So so Sweet. do do visit Kualoa man, uh, uh, Ranch when you go there. Kualoa Ranch is just one of the most beautiful locations you'll ever see in your and life. I, and I think when I was looking at your pictures, you recognize that valley where they're running through in Jurassic Park, you know, where they're running with the... Um, with some of the dinosaurs away from the T-Rexes coming. And then I think that's also probably one of the valleys where they were, wa- like, when they're, whenever they were walking somewhere and lost. Like when they were walking to find the Black Rock yeah. ship and stuff like that. You know, they're always walking through, like, that valley. Or, Absolutely. And they're walking it to looked find, very the, familiar. find the, ante- the, the antenna that they found that was broadcasting the numbers. You know, you had to be like, holy crap, Saeed once walked <laughs> through this, you know. I know. Like, I, I can still see you, Hurley's footprint. Oh, you know what? Okay, so there's there's um, uh, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Yeah. He, he, yeah. There's a story that they told on the, the tour of Kualoa that we went on about uh, Dwayne Johnson. And he has relatives uh, on Oahu. And so he comes back and visits a lot, and of course, Kualoa Ranch is where he's filmed some some of uh, some of his movies. Sure. And oh man, they they've got such stories about him. He's supposed to be a really cool guy. And um, one time there was a tour, a bus tour, coming through uh, the jungle there, and for some reason he just jumped out of of the trees in front of the bus <laughs> <laughs> and just i mean the people were startled of course but but then he went on the bus and shook everybody's hand um and then he also uh one time when he was there they also have ATV tours, which is something I'd like to do next time sure. or a horseback riding tour but on one of the ATV tours he he was like all right, guys, could I run the tour? I just want to run one of the ATV tours. Now, how cool would that be? Right, having the rock run a- your ATV tour. Absolutely. So, you know, unfortunately, no one jumped out at us. Maybe next time. Like the rock didn't show up and, like, kiss his biceps. Like <laughs> no, but I would, I would have loved to see see that. See that, but he's he's supposed to be very supportive of the local community and the schools there. That um, does a lot of work, um, you know, to give back to right, the community. He, well, he has some Pacific Islander in him, doesn't he? They, like he's. I think he might, he's some. I think he might be Samoan because our guide, I think, said something about that. Again, forgive me if I get it wrong, but our, our guide was talking about being from Samoa, uh, which is another Polynesian island, and that that. Uh, that, that he's from Samoa as sure. well. And, and so we got- he would make a perfect husband because of that. Okay. Because they're both okay. Samoa and they have so much in common. <laughs> okay. There you go. Um, but, you know, the other thing that uh, was was startling up about um, seeing those memorials that we were talking about, uh, you know, anytime you, you pass near someone's grave, you know, you get this feeling of reverence. Um, there was another grave that we came upon that had more of a... Um, a marker that, that was more westernized because it had the kid's name on it and his date of uh, birth and date of death. And he actually uh, walked on when he was only 17 years old. And so we just stumbled onto his grave site. Okay. It was just along the side of the road. And that grave site was, was so decorated. I've never seen a more decorated grave. I mean, people had planted trees and different tropical plants around it and there were all, all these these uh, rocks around it which were inscribed uh was with, he the, was with he different the, messages to him was he the big kahuna well I, I i don't recall his name and i wouldn't say it if i did just to be uh, respectful right but um 
yeah, he he was very important to to the people that knew him. You could just, you know, feel it from all the messages of love uh, written on these stones. And there was a, a little tree that was covered with, uh, with uh, owl ornaments. Owls must have been important to him. Uh, and there was an owl on his grave marker. And so we're looking around it because it's, it just, was just like a visual feast. There's lays on, ro- on the rocks around it. You know, we're reading the messages. We're looking all around. And then suddenly I noticed that sitting off just a, just a foot uh, or so from the grave was this big brown dog that was actually posed like the Sphinx. Okay. And I'm like, Scott... Has that dog been there the whole time? <laughs> because I'm telling you, we were maybe there for five minutes looking at all the, the various things left behind for the deceased. And I was startled to see that there was something alive in there and that he was sitting so still. I mean, he did look at us, but then just maintained his, his sphinx-like demeanor. And so was there any... Uh like a guardian i feel like he was a guardian of the dog grave. was guarding yeah. the grave and that was just like in the middle of the street or what was it well it was off of a highway we okay. were driving past and i'm like wait scott hey there's a monument and so we we went back and so it was just right off of the highway if you blink you would miss it okay and the dog and it's away from you know there's no houses around or anything now, like that and the that. dog got up on hind legs no and came out no it. no it was a but, bipedal dog. <laughs> no, no, no biped, don't bipedalism, none whatsoever. Okay. But, you know, that he was sitting so stoically like that, as if he was some sentinel. Protecting the big kahuna's grave. Yeah. Well, that's that's interesting. And it's also, I mean, 17 years old, it's also sad. Yeah. But uh, so that's, that's a common thing to have the markers and everything like that on the sides of the roads. That's certainly unique. Well, yeah, well, I don't know if it's a common thing. That's that's the only one we saw along the but, sides of the you road. But you said you said you saw a long, lot along the beach. Uh, yes, and and so this is something we would have never seen without Lopaka. So as I said, Lopaka from Mysteries of Hawaii, uh, he and his wife took us out to see some sacred sites. And you saw a cave, right? What was about the cave? Yeah, so uh, near those areas where those those graves were as... I just mentioned, there's also this cave. It's a sacred cave. And when Lopaka took us there, he would sing in Hawaiian asking for permission to enter the cave. And at that time, when we went to the cave, he sang and then he said, okay, we have five minutes. Okay. And that that's what he said the spirit told him is we have five minutes in the cave. So, of course, we wanted to be respectful sure. of that. And it's a cave right off the ocean. And so we went into the cave and we did find uh, there was a flat stone in there with some type of offering for the spirit of the cave. And so as we were looking around, Scott, of course. Wait, so somebody just left an offering for the spirit of the cave in there. That's right. It wasn't Lopaka, like did a setup or something like that. No. He's like, hold on, I got to kill this chicken and throw it in. No, no, there were no dead chickens. Although there were a lot of live chickens around. Okay. In the street, <laughs> there, there's chickens. No, yeah, there's chickens everywhere. Yeah. There's, there's chickens and little chicks everywhere. You, so you go to a restaurant, you go sit outside uh, to eat your meal, and the, the chickens chicken. come right up the to you. The chicken sits with yep. you. Okay. Pretty much, yes. Uh, we did have a meal where uh, the, the chicken did jump up on the bench by us and sat right by us in the, the booster seat. This is really okay, true. Okay. Now tell us. <laughs> now tell us more about the cave. So you saw the offering in the cave, and what was the spirit of the cave like? What did the spirit of the cave do? Well, Lopak is going to have to tell you more about that. I mean, it was it was a spirit that it sometimes takes shark form, apparently, but I. I don't. Re- I can't really claim to understand it. Again, these these a lot of these stories, you know, they're they're not part of you know my upbringing. So you know, it's a reach for me to to understand you know exactly you know what the uh, legends are, what what the beliefs are, um, and so it would be better for you to talk to an expert about right, that. But, but, but I do think I saw something. Okay, so what'd you see? All right, so we're in there. And we're just looking around. We see the offering, and we have five minutes, so we don't have long. And we just want to go uh, far as far back into the cave as possible. And it isn't a very big cave, so 
it doesn't like go on forever you that have a we picture could of the see. Cave, right? We do. Yeah, we'll put that okay. in the show notes. But uh, so we we're looking around, and of course we've got our flashlights in there because it's it's pitch dark. It is a cave. It's a cave at night. And there's water in the cave, right? No. Okay, there's no water in the cave. There's that, no that's why water. I thought there might be water in the cave, and that's the, maybe the shark comes up. and. No, no, that would be horrifying if right. there was water in the cave. Right. No, like I, he, I like, like where you're Lop- going with that. Lopaka has to sing to Jaws. I, I mean, if we did the movie version, that's totally how we'd set. Yeah, that, okay. I could really see that working. But no, okay. it's a cave, no water. And so we're, we're walking in, and you know we're panning our, our flashlights left and right. So... At first, that's what I thought this was. So way up over my head on on one side of the cave, I see like a little flicker. And I almost just wrote it off because I usually do write things off and say, oh, oh, it's just this. And I was thinking at that time, oh, it's just the flashlight. Okay. You know, someone panned the flashlight up there until I saw a glimmer on the other side, like very soon after. And uh, again, I might have just written it off as, you know, while someone panned the flashlight over the other way. But then Lopaka looked at me and he said, you saw something, didn't you? And I'm like, yeah, I did. (laughs) And he said, you're not crazy. As if he was seeing it too. And and he said, and I was like, well, what did you see? And, And he repeated that he had just seen a glimmer on the sides of the cave, but that was evidence of the spirit inhabiting the cave. Okay, so you had a shared experience with Lopaga. In, that's right. In the cave of the shark spirit. That's right. Okay, pretty and good, pretty good. That's not the only thing. Uh, so Scott's in there, and of course he's trying to snap off as many pictures as he can. He, he loves photography, and I love for him to take pictures when we go to haunted locations. Sure. So his camera like any camera i'm sure malfunctions once in a while but he had a malfunction in the cave that he had never experienced before and his flash would just not sync up with with the rest of the camera and so he couldn't get any shots off and as soon as we got out of the cave it worked perfectly okay so that i mean that's something that's fairly fairly common when you hear these stories either the battery runs out quickly like completely or like a piece of camera equipment won't work that works fine right outside absolutely and you know every and other the, and time the spirit's just camera shy he's like hey man yeah like i gave hey, you man. A, i gave you a glimmer and that's what you get. yeah that's what you get and i gave you five minutes and now you're you're bothering me with your flash right. so perhaps that w- that's what was going on now Boy, Mike, I'm so on the fence. You know, I can't say that this is definitive proof of a spirit. I want to believe, but, you know, it's 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 hard for me to fully commit. But I've got to say, you know, any other time, you know, I heard, I've, I've heard people talk about uh, equipment malfunctions. I was like, sure, you just didn't charge the battery right, or you're, whatever. You're an but, idiot. But, yeah. This is what is going through my head. I'm sorry. I'm just being no, honest. No, it's true. Same thing. Yeah, with me. they're just, like, oh, yeah, uh, it totally didn't work. And I'm yeah, like, that's because you're a total idiot. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, right. Okay, so this might not have been so compelling had it not happened to me before. You know, in spring, I had, um, I went to a, a, a local um, uh, American Legion post, and I gave a presentation there about ghost stories from of Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. And you know, Mike, because I extensively practiced the presentation with you the night before. That's right. On this brand new uh, projector that I had bought. And I bought it because they didn't have a projector at the American Legion. And I really didn't want to just have to talk and not have slides. Because I have all these incredible pictures of haunts in the Milwaukee area. So I went there, you know, after, you know, testing it. Uh, the night before and the morning of, it was all set to go. I had been working uh, with uh, the projector for hours the night before, making sure the presentation was just right. You know, my fonts, they were a little off and the picture was a little off. Right. So I was really, you know, really dug into it. And then I get there, I turn it on and it won't stay on for more than two minutes. <laughs> now, but at the same time though, was it, did the American Legion place, did that have a st- series, did that have any ghosts there? Yes. Okay, so that had rumors of hauntings at the American Legion post. Yes, and the other thing I felt 
that it was a message since we had moved some pictures of servicemen to provide a, a blank wall so that we could have a screen for the presentation. And I felt maybe we had done that improperly, and maybe that's why the projector just kept shutting off. And I just don't know, Mike, because you know I texted you and I called you in a panic that yeah, day. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, because I was like, Mike, what is wrong with this thing? And he's like, is it overheating? I'm like, it's not It's not hot. It, it was in the trunk of the car. It was cold, if anything. Yeah, it was cold. And it just wouldn't work. And okay. we tried everything. And then when I got home, it I fine. turned it on and it worked fine. Okay. Well, they, they, <laughs> I mean, there's two examples of yeah. something something happening to the... Uh, to the electronics that you're using. And, and that's what they are. I mean, people will say that spirits, uh, that's something they can affect. Right. Like that's that's the, the littlest thing they can affect, battery or energy or things like that, is something that they can affect. and Because they, they, they might not be able to touch you, they might not be able to appear, but they can certainly screw with your stuff. Yeah. So that's interesting that now you've had two experiences in the same year. Of, of that. that. And, and so, like I said... Before it happened to me, I thought it was just ridiculousness. And then it happens to you. And you see all the steps that you went through. And you see that it works. As soon as you're out of the situation, it works. And so you really got to ask yourself, what's going on? Yeah, that is, that's true. That's, that there is some kind of mystery that the, the gremlins, the ghost in the machine, uh, literally. So, um, well, speaking of, when you talk about gremlins... And you think about coming from World War II, where people talked about gremlins interfering with the machinery yeah. and airplanes, and right. that was their explanation for it. Well, it was gremlins screwing with it as a joke when they couldn't figure out why something was broken. You know, speaking of World War II, now your final story is about when you visited the USS Arizona. Yes. I mean, when, when you go to Oahu, one of your one of your stops has to be at the Arizona Memorial. So we went to Pearl Harbor, and the Arizona Memorial was just a you know, our experience of it was just very powerful. And so we recorded some audio of when we're waiting to go to the memorial, and we didn't record any audio there because we just didn't feel it would show proper respect. And then we, when we returned, Scott and I talked about our reactions and the things that we had learned or were surprised by. Okay. I'm waiting to be picked up by the boat that takes visitors out to the USS Arizona Memorial. The USS Arizona was one of the ships involved in the Pearl Harbor attack of December 7th, 1941, a day that will live in infamy. Now, today the USS Arizona serves as a final resting place for 1,177 sailors um, who couldn't get out of the ship uh, once it was hit. It only took nine minutes to sink, so most of the crew Again, uh, 1,177 men of the 1,400-member crew perished. And most of the bodies are still within the hull of the USS Arizona. So Scott and I just got back from the Arizona Memorial. And we didn't record any audio on the memorial itself because we didn't feel that that would show the proper respect. And we were asked, everyone asked, was asked to um, show a, a reverent attitude, to ref, refrain from uh, talking loudly. Speak in uh, hushed tones. Yeah, speak in hushed tones, because it is an active grave site. Uh, you know, I, I knew that there were men trapped in the hull. As I said in the intro, uh, 1,177 died uh, on the Arizona in the Pearl Harbor attack of December 7th, 1941. And there are 988 that are still entombed in the ship. I guess the one surprise for me was that 
the survivors of the Arizona as they as they move on yes. as they walk on they um, are now uh, many of them asking to be interned with their shipmates so uh, there have been ceremonies where they've taken the ashes of these survivors and um, returned them to the ship they actually have divers that go down and return them, and they talk about the feeling of having the, you know, the urn. It's a little military urn that they have, and they say they can almost feel the urn being drawn in as they put it through the, the hull. As if the ship is taking them back. Yeah. And there's a special place where they put it in, um, I think they call it a, a barbarette. It's a round... Uh, Opening in the ship where the uh, gun, the the guns, gun turret? the gun turret. There, that's what I'm looking for. The gun turret mm-hmm. um, was once placed, and the ghost stories about the Arizona Memorial mainly, um, from what I've read, have to do with you know the terrible tragedy of how these men were lost in the ship. Um, Hopefully, many of them were were just killed instantly by the explosion. But because the ship sunk fo- so fast uh, in less than ten minutes, a number of them were trapped in the hull. Yeah, yeah. A, a number of them were trapped. They may have been feet underwater. Yeah, just, but yeah, you know, not not tens, not hundreds of feet. No, feet under the water, and yet they couldn't get out. Right. The other thing that was interesting, or not interesting, but I think needs to be mentioned is we talk about the Arizona Memorial because that's the one that gets all the attention but just to be here you know there are a number of other ships that were sunk here a number of other people died in a number of other ships and the attack on Pearl Harbor had 200 you know over 2,400 people died just in that one battle you know and then you think about all the Americans that died in the war and all the people that did you know died even before we got involved in the war Mm-hmm. You know, you just see these rings going out and out and out and out. And so if you start with just the Arizona Memorial, as tragic as that was, that was one tragedy amongst greater and greater ever-expanding rings. Of tragedy. And, you know, you're mentioning uh, the rings there uh, has me thinking of of uh, the oil seeping, that is still seeping out of the ship and how how it comes out like a... A tiny black uh, oh, sphere, yeah. yeah, of darkness, and then how it expands out like the, those rings of tragedy during the war. You get that shimmery rainbow effect on the top. Yeah, it's um, actually quite beautiful. I could actually smell the oil. That's you can what still smell. I could really yeah. smell it, and I was really surprised about that. And um, the ghost stories concern hearing knocking because uh, the Arizona Memorial is built on top of the of the sunken ship and so many people have reported hearing knocking from inside the hull of the ship as if someone is still trapped in there or screams you know other sounds of torment uh, and recently uh, a tourist did take pictures of the drops of oil that the, the that expand out on the surface of the waves, and it's probably just pareidolia, but uh, she believes that she captured a a face of one of the victims, and you know it's a pretty interesting photo, although it probably is you know just our pattern pattern seeking going on. Um, it it really makes someone think of the tragic circumstances. Yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a, an amazing uh, memorial because it is so sparse. You know, it's essentially like the section of a bridge crossed over the the hull of the ship, and uh, you've just got windows on the side so you can look down into you know the remains because you can see them from you know the top. You can see them right underneath the surface of the water. Yeah, you they, can see the ship. 
Yeah. Very clearly. And then just on one side they have the wall with all the names of the servicemen that have died there. You know, naval and marines, army, you know, that kind of thing. Not marines, I think it was naval and army. Uh, so, yeah, very very uh, startling and sobering experience today visiting the Arizona Memorial at Pearl Harbor. All right, so it seems like you... Uh, you saw the little pieces of oil coming up in the water, you know, you, the, the oil from the uh, the ship. Now, there's a, somebody put up a ghost picture of that? Yeah, there's a, a famous picture that I think came out in uh, 2011. A tourist was snapping photos of the oil seeping out of the hull of the ship, which is, you know, still below the memorial. Right. Uh, you know, this um, the ship is just a few feet below the water and you know there's so many servicemen that are that, that that's their final resting place that's the only way right. to say it so what you did so the, you see the oil come up and somebody took a picture and it looks like a face in the oil yeah because it comes up like like a it looks like this little black marble coming up and except that you can really smell that it's oil and and so did you see any faces in the oil well, I got to say that um, it does span out in the waves uh, into this, you know, beautiful like rainbow haze. And, you know, you can see a lot of things in that. But, you know, there is this famous ghost picture. And you well, re- really have to ask yourself, is is this a, the face of one of the servicemen trapped down below? And we'll link, we'll link to that in the show notes and also link to an episode of the new Twilight Zone that they had, um, this was one of my favorites, that it was the reason you see faces in everything. Now, the reason we see faces in everything oh, is that... Oh, yeah, is that I love humans, that episode. ...is that humans are trained to see faces in everything. I mean, they, they even there's a, there's a theory, there's the grandmother neuron, that everybody's face has its own, you know, neuron. So that's how you recognize them. And humans have the most, humans and apes, kind of, have the most different kinds of faces of anything in the animal kingdom. And it's because we, that's how we visually see each other. You can't, we don't sniff each other's butts like dogs. Oh, thank you're God. Like, you're like, okay, oh no, I know it's my sister. <laughs> I said my sister because I know her, her butt smell. And that's right. We don't, do oh, that like, we don't do that like dogs. We recognize each other by faces. And so the reason, and that's the reason we see faces in clouds and we see faces in the wood and we see faces in the wall. But in the episode, the reason is, is because there really are people trapped in the wall and they're trapped in the clouds and they're trapped in every surface. And um, I'll link to that. And that's a really great Twilight Zone. Yeah, that's one of my favorite episodes of the new Twilight Zone. Yeah, that's that's a classic. So Hawaii sounds like you had a great haunted time. You had a couple of experiences there, which is exciting. And uh, you, it sounds like you really had a had a lot of fun. Yeah, I did. And, you know, like like I said, I was able to go on the Mysteries of Hawaii Ghost Tour and the Oahu Ghost Tours. And next time I'd really like to go on one of the uh, Honolulu Ghost and Mystery Tours given by Stephen Frederick. So much uh, rich folklore and history there, which is one of our favorite things, right, Mike? That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And if people want to go on your ghost tour, where do they find you again? MilwaukeeGhost.com. Okay, thanks, Allison. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Mike. Aloha. Aloha. And the song this week is about that spirit at the bottom of the well that Allison was telling us about. We all have that person that we dread to hear them call because we know what happens when we answer it. This song is called The Call. Bloodshot eyes and nicotine fingers Where you been? The silence lingers The same old song from the same old singer And the tune is getting old And I think we've been down this rabbit hole Oh
Wait and damage goods This fixer up is just a money listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. It's all real. Be afraid. Be very afraid.